Right, I was wondering, you, you emphasize the you, and I hadn't thought of that. Uh, <laughs> meditate because you want to. Okay. Come in, you're not too late. Last people then have to sit at the front. So, good. Welcome, everybody. Uh, nice to see you all. My fifth or sixth time back at the BF, and I'm grateful to be able to uh, come and see you all and meet with you and reconnect with old friends in Singapore while I'm here, uh, engaged in the never-ending battle of visa applications in Thailand. And... Uh, you know, the Buddha taught there are five hindrances. I think there are six, if you include visa application processes. So. <clears throat> uh, this uh, topic, meditate because you want to, was a kind of fun thing that I thought up. Uh, I read a book called Made to Stick. And if you're engaged in any kind of PR, I'd recommend you read this book. And it says how to make ideas sticky, how to make people take notice. And one of the ways to make people take notice is to say something that is almost correct, but not quite what you expect. And so the idea of meditate because you want to, why else would you meditate? Is somebody making you meditate that you really don't want to? Of course not. Everybody meditates because they want to. Most people. I did have one friend in Burma, and while she was growing up, uh, while she was meditating was the only way her parents could make her keep quiet. So they made her pocket money dependent on doing meditation. And so she used to meditate for six hours a day because she'd get all this pocket money. <laughs> this was in the tradition of Sunlun Sayadaw, if you know him. Does anyone know Sunlun Sayadaw? Uh, it's Dharma, Jim, but not as you know it. It's very um, like heavy breathing, hard breathing, high concentration kind of very ferocious style of meditation. So I, uh, coming here, I notice in, in Singapore you do a lot of Dharma talks, all everywhere, Dharma talks, Dharma talks. And uh, I am the person who organizes the Dharma talks in Bangkok. There's really only one group, uh, and that goes through me, my group, uh, for Dharma in English. There's a few in Thai. Uh, but in English, really, I'm the only one that's arranging anything. I'm kind of like the Buddhist fellowship of Bangkok. Um, but now that we're under a military dictator, I thought I might, I might have to move to Singapore. And so I'm going to set up the little Bangkok Sangha in exile in <laughs> Singapore. <laughs> So a lot of these uh, Dharma talks, um, I kind of got bored with it in Bangkok, because mostly because I've heard most of my Dharma talks before. And so I, I was looking for different ways to bring people together rather than uh, doing just the Dharma talks. So in recent uh, times, I've been branching out, and we do kind of more lunches and movie events, um, Sometimes we do the day-long workshops. I have a new venue for that now. Uh, the, uh, we did a Qigong and Vipassana workshop uh, a few days ago. So I like to find ways to keep it alive, keep the Dharma alive, keep it interesting. Um, and then it, that always helps to bring in uh, new people. You have to be a bit careful, though. Uh, this Qigong and Vipassana workshop that we did, the Qigong teacher, she's very beautiful <laughs> and very articulate. And she's very good at Qigong and very enthusiastic. So we had all morning of Qigong with her. Then we did an afternoon session and then a, a session of meditation with me. And for the final session, I said, right, so what do you all want to do? And they're like, Qigong. We, we <laughs> We've seen you. We know you already. Give us more of the new stuff. <laughs> so the meditation is something that, you know, you get used to. It is repetitive. It is boring in some ways. So we need to find ways to 
uh, bring it alive, to make it more interesting, to com- uh, continually reinvigorate our commitment to doing the practice. And this really is what I see my role as. Uh, what I've been trying to do is facilitate and encourage other people to come and you know practice Dharma, whether that's coming for lunch and making Dharma friends or joining together in activities or actually doing meditation. Uh, I think just so long as we're pulling people together uh, in the name of Dharma, uh, I think that's a very good and a very beautiful thing. Here in Singapore, I notice you have so many Dharma talks that you have uh, a lot of different teachers from different traditions. And I'm not sure if you feel like you're being pulled from one direction to another direction sometimes. And because everybody has a slightly different approach, they have different thoughts and different feelings and uh, different vinaya and you know different styles of meditation. So sometimes if you do a lot of these kind of Dharma talks, it can get a little bit confusing. And then what happens is you start to differentiate like, well, you know, this guy said this and this guy says this, right? We're going to forget those guys and we're going to go with these guys. And then uh, even with these guys, some of them, like, they do this in the... In this, and then you start to get a little um, critical of the uh, people that you're seeing. And so this topic was really a reminder that meditation is here or Dharma is here is something that we should do because we love it and not to get too caught up in the little details and the little fights and the little squabbles and the disagreements and uh, and all the rest of the things that can come up whenever we have a human society. Right? Whenever you put human beings together, you're going to get, you know, egos come into play and people want to do, you know, want to take the group or everybody in this direction and then somebody else has a different... It's going to happen whenever you put people together. Where I'm from, North England, they say there's now it's the queerest folk, but not many people can understand me when I say that. Translated into Queen's English, it means there's nothing as strange as people, uh, is the saying. And so this is something we need to, whenever you get Dharma communities come together, uh, including for us in Bangkok, um, this kind of thing we need to be a little bit careful of. And remember, we're doing Dharma because we love to do Dharma. Really, there's no other... Uh, necessary explanation for it. We don't need to split up into different factions and groups and things like that. I invite a lot of teachers, a bit like you do here in, in Singapore, so any time there's a teacher passing through Bangkok, I, if I know them and they're, if they're reputable and if they can speak English, that helps. I've made that mistake before. Um, <laughs> uh, then I invite them and we set up events. And different people like to come to different events. Some people like to do the workshops. Some people only come if there's food involved. <laughs> it's being Thailand, you know. Food has to be involved. Uh, every two or three times a year, somebody will email me and say, please inform me when you have an event with Ajahn Jayasara, but not all the other stuff. Only Ajahn Jayasaro. <laughs> I'm like, no, I'm not doing that. Do you love Dharma or do you love Ajahn Jayasaro? You know, y- y- this is what I, I call kind of inspiration junkies, that you can have a teacher and you're inspired by this teacher and maybe a really good teacher. I mean, Ajahn Jayasaro, he's one of the best. But then if you make that your standard, then nobody else is going to measure up. Nobody else does Ajahn Jayasaro as good as Ajahn Jayasaro does, right? So then nobody else measures up, and then they're like, you know, I don't want to come to your talks, just let me know if you're doing something with Ajahn Jayasaro. <laughs> so I say, no, do you love Dharma or don't you? So I, I was, since you do all of these uh, Dharma talks, I thought I'd introduce a couple of things that you might not have heard of before. So one of them was a piece of research that I was looking at recently. And this research was about was by psychologists, of which I, I count myself as a psychologist. And us psychologists are very, what's the word, slippery. We never quite tell the truth. And there was a, a test done, and they told the participants that the test was being done about 
exercise. And they sent the volunteers, the participants, to do some exercise in a park that was a 10-minute walk away. Right. So 10 minutes walk, you do your exercise, 10 minutes back, and you report back at the center. And the exercise was nothing to do with it. It's the usual way with psychologists, never tell the truth. What, was, what they were actually testing was how much you ate after doing the exercise. So one group was told to go to the park, and they were told that the walk to the park was 10 minutes, and they should consider it part of the exercise routine. Uh, walk to the park, do the 10 minutes in the park and walk back. So 20 minutes walking. This 20 minutes, consider it part of your exercise uh, of getting the body moving and warming up, etc. And the second group was told, when you go to the, as you walk to the park, the exercise is in the park and the park is 10 minutes walk away. So just enjoy the walk. It's a nice walk. Have a look around at the scenery. And then when the people came back, they were tested. They were asked to fill out a questionnaire and answer some questions about their exercise. And while they were answering the questions, there were some snacks put out in front of them. And what the researchers wanted to know was how many calories the people would eat after doing the exercise. <laughs> so the, what do you think? Out of these two groups, which one ate more calories? The second one, the second group, no, first group. Why would the first group eat more than the second group? More, well, they've actually done the exact same amount of exercise, but they feel like they've done more exercise because it was called exercise, and now they feel they deserve a reward. So they deserve extra calories. They've earned calorie credits and... Um, but the group that was told to uh, enjoy the walk, they ate less because they felt like they'd had a nice time and they'd already been rewarded for doing the 10 minutes exercise in the field. They'd been rewarded with this nice walk. So it's interesting that just a very slight change in your attitude to the way that you approach something you know, can really make a difference to uh, how it feels and how it feels has a big influence on how often you do it. Okay. There's some other interesting variations they put on this experiment, if you're interested. It's not connected with the Dharma, but if you're interested. Uh, some of the snacks they put out were M&Ms. And if they put blue and red M&Ms in a bowl, people would scoop out a certain number, right? And the researchers would count how many they took. But if they put the blue M&Ms in one bowl and the red M&Ms in another bowl, they ate more. People would eat more M&Ms just because they were split up. And if they put out one bowl and you scooped up a handful and then they brought a second bowl in, you ate nearly double the amount of M&Ms because it's something new that's coming in. You're like, ooh, any time there's something new, right, you want to reach out and have a little bit more which is why I was saying earlier, I try to find ways to make Dharma into something new, new ways to, to do it rather than just talks by setting up workshops and lunches and different kinds of things. Because uh, any time it feels like something new, people are, oh. And it, there's no difference, by the way, between different colored M&Ms. It's just food coloring. There's no difference in the taste, calories, weight, chocolate, nothing. They are exactly the same. So the lesson that we can uh, learn from this test, uh, from this uh, psychology test, is that we really need to make meditation into something that we enjoy, into something that we do because we love to do it. And sometimes that's not the way meditation is presented, right? Very often when people present meditation, meditation teachers want to present meditation, they say, you can reduce your cholesterol by meditating. Right? You can lower your blood pressure by doing meditation. Is that true or not true? I believe it's true, but I'm not sure how true it is. Uh, the research actually shows that meditation does help to lower your cholesterol, um, but not as much as yoga. So if cholesterol and, uh, sorry, the, if the blood pressure is your goal, then maybe do a bit of yoga and then do the meditation. 
Meditation to get rid of stress. I love this one. I do some talks. Do you know the... I'm not going to name the group. And they're a business group. And so I've done some meditation events with them before. And they're, they're all very well-off businessmen. Right? So they say, right, we don't want any of the nonsense. We want the best teacher to come in, give us the shortest teaching that's the most effective at removing the most amount of stress. <laughs> and I said, why? So you can get back to work. Yes, that's it. <laughs> so we did it. But, uh, you know, I like the people who, who come to the, the meditation with a sense of patience, with a sense of humor, with a sense of love of Dharma rather than trying to get something out of it, rather than... Do you do meditation because it's going to reduce your stress level? Do you do it because it's going to improve your self-control? It may do, but if you call it that, you're not going to enjoy it as much. And also, you're going to rebound from the meditation, right? Because you've made meditation into work, just like those people whose walking was exercise, because you made meditation to work, it's something then that you rebound from and then you give yourself time off, right? Now I've done my half an hour of meditation. I've earned myself enough karma credits to do two hours watching Game of Thrones. I'm watching to see who laughs there. The other ones who are watching Game of Thrones, right? <laughs> but if you call the meditation, if you call it to yourself, if you name it something that you love, you do because you love to do it if you, you do dharma because you love dharma, then when you finish the meditation, you're less likely to rebound from it and indulge in you know, some sensory delight and pleasure and more likely to keep the meditation going. The latest one, the latest benefit from meditation, gene expression. Meditation improves your gene expression. Have you heard this one? And there's a teacher talking about this and I'm like, I was a bit skeptical. I consider myself a good scientist, a, a researcher and a scientist. I like facts. I don't like hocus pocus. I don't like um, new age treatments for things. I like medicines, chemical medicines that's been proven. That's just my way. I like science. And so this meditation, the teacher was there saying, you know, meditation will improve your gene expression. And I'm like, I said, What's gene expression? And he said, I don't know, but it's better for meditators. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds a bit like um, one of my heroes, Muhammad Ali, remember? He, somebody said to him, he was acting up, and the reporter said to him, Ali, you're being very impetuous today. And Ali replied, I don't know what impetuous means, but if it's good, I'm it. <laughs> so... Gene expression. Um, hopefully we've all got very well expressed genes now being meditators. Mm. So why do we do stuff? Uh, the, the motivations for doing stuff is uh, something that's also imp is important to consider. You know, when, we, when we're picking up meditation and when we're joining events and when we're going to places, uh, it's important to consider the motivation. And what usually happens with human beings is they like something and then they find reasons for it afterwards, right? Usually you like something and then you, you, afterwards you think of all kinds of reasons for why you should like that. So you might like football and then you say, well, I like football because, you know, it's good exercise or it's sport or it's beautiful or, you know, all the reasons come afterwards. Usually your initial motivation is you do things because you like to do them because, or because your peers are doing them or because your friends are doing them something. And then all the thinking comes afterwards. And I think this is the same with Dharma groups, the different Dharma groups that I've uh, been around. is Very often they kind of split up and have different kinds of thinking and like this faction like monks from this tradition and this faction they like only meditation and this faction they like more study and do you know Ajahn Brahmot? I heard he's quite popular in Singapore right now. Uh, he, was, he was like the meteoric rise to fame in Thailand a few years ago. And well-deserved. I mean, I, I've met him a couple of times. And um, he's, if, there's an if there's an arahant around, he will be it. 
uh, and he shot to fame, like too high, too far, too soon kind of thing. And one of the groups that I also go to in Bangkok is a uh, Abhidharma group, and they're uh, Abhidharma fanatics, and they have these classes that run Abhidharma. But then, you see, if you do a lot of Abhidharma and you've recited all these lists and you've learned all this Abhidharma, um, then you start to look down on people who don't do Abhidharma, right? Because that's your way of understanding. That's what you've practiced. And if someone else doesn't practice that, they haven't understood as much as you have. So you get this, you always get this creeping in of, you know, the ego and the, the, the thoughts and your explanations. So in this Abhidhamma group, they really didn't like Ajahn Brahmod, you see, because Ajahn Brahmod is a, is, he's just a meditator. Uh, he doesn't really even know much about Buddhism in, in the sense of an uh, academic way. So they didn't like him. They said, oh, he's, he's no good because he's, uh, he hasn't done Abhidhamma. He can't be enlightened. He has to go through our Abhidhamma class to get enlightened. Too. And then there was some scandals about him. Actually, not about him, about his the organization that was supporting him. It was, actually, he doesn't care less about anything. He's finished. He's done. Um, you know, he doesn't care about these things. So this Abhidhamma group were printing out the newspaper articles about him and blowing them up and putting them all over the walls and, and doing things like this. And this is what can happen is because you're moving away from that initial love of Dharma and start getting caught up in these little minute is that the word, in the details, and then start to draw comparisons. And then the thing that you do, you start to value more highly than the thing another person does. We have this in Thailand. It's called Vinaya Wars in Thailand and monks f fighting over Vinaya over the rules, regulations. And I was in one temple when I first got hit with a, a Vinaya war. I was in one temple, and it was a semi-forest temple. And th we had coffee in the morning, and I put milk in my coffee, and this monk came to me and said, that's your meal. I said, that's my coffee? <laughs> He said, no, you put milk in your coffee. If you put milk, milk is food. And if you put milk in your coffee, your coffee cup is your bowl and the milk is your meal for the day and you can't eat anything else for the rest of the day. It's like, that milk is my meal? I'm like, if I put sugar in, is that my dessert or something? <laughs> <laughs> and that was his view. His view... I pointed out that coffee has calories in as well as milk, so why, why would you consider... Because they would drink black coffee. Other people say you can't drink black coffee because it's addictive. What is it? Is it against the rule or not against the rule? People start getting all these ridiculous ideas and all these... And then fighting over it, getting very tight about it. And I'm here thinking, you know, I'm drinking my cup of coffee. I'm sorry, I'm eating my meal. Um, and, I, and I'm thinking, you know... You live in a forest temple, which is quite strict, and you, and you, I don't know, in my view, that's not understanding Dharma. That's not doing Dharma because you love Dharma. That's using Vinaya, using these rules as a stick to beat other people with. And that's not what Buddhism was about. That's not what Dharma was about. So even if you live in a forest temple and live in a very strict lifestyle, that doesn't really mean that you're you know, better, that you're somehow progressing better in Dharma. It just means that you're more fanatic about drinking coffee, black coffee, doesn't it? There's uh, a temple in Bangkok called Wat, Wat, um, I'm not going to tell you the name of the temple. You're recording, aren't you? I'm, I forgot about that. I'm going to have to be a bit careful here. <laughs> And in this temple, I'm not joking, each building has different rules. And in one building, you're allowed coffee mate, right? In the evening and in the morning. In another building, milk is your meal. Put milk in your coffee, that's your meal for the day. In another building, they don't allow sugar, but they do allow molasses. And in another building, they don't allow tea or coffee because they say it's addictive. So I stayed there one night, and in the morning, I had to go around six different buildings just to get my cup of coffee, get <laughs> different ingredient from each building. And it's almost like they're competing with each other, you know, seeing how they can outdo each other. And then it's a way to look down on the other people, isn't it? 
right? Like we're not going to have coffee mates in the evening. And then, actually, I'll tell you the truth: the the vinaya is, uh, as I said before, you think of the reasons afterwards. You know, you do what you like, what you want, what you. Th- but the reasons come afterwards. So for all of these vinaya rules, really, it's not a case of whether you can have milk or you can't have milk or things like this. It's a case that you do what your temple does, right? If I'm living in a temple, uh, for example, my temple, we can have milk in the evening. My the temple where I ordained, you can have milk in the evening, but not soya milk. That was considered food. Ajahn Sumedho's group will have soya milk, but they won't have regular milk. But Wat Pa Pong in North Thailand bans soya milk as well. So then they'll, they'll not have soya milk when they're in Thailand, but they will if they're in England. It starts getting a little crazy, right? But the point is not whether one of these rules is correct and one of them is incorrect. The, the point is you do what you do in your temple. If all the monks around you, you follow a particular rule, then that's what you follow, right? My temple, they use the orange, the orange color. I don't like that. It's very useful if you have a skiing accident and you 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 want to attract a helicopter, but you know I like the brown. But my temple you wears the orange color, so I'm going to wear the orange color. And they wear it underarm, which is more difficult than overarm. I don't know if you've noticed. There's different ways. Um, but you know I follow that system because that's what we do in the temple. And every temple has its own funny little rules and regulations and. Um, so I was with the Ajahn Chah monks, and I noticed when I put my bowl down, every time I came back, my strap had been put straight over my bowl. And I realized somebody's following me around and straightening my strap. Yeah. And when I look around, I see all of them have perfectly neat straps. And I realized that's a thing that they do. They consider that put your bowl down mindfully and put the strap correct. So th- I'll follow that. I'll put my strap correct. They also carry their bags on their shoulders, which in my university is considered very rude to carry your bag on your shoulder. I do that all the time, but when I enter the university, I take it off. I don't know if you've noticed, um, sometimes you take pictures of monks. If you take photos of monks and they have their bag on their shoulder, when you take the picture, they'll take their bag off and hold it here. You know, you probably don't notice because you don't know the rule, but they're not supposed to carry the bag on the shoulder. I shouldn't have told you that because now you're going to be looking around these monks. <laughs> <laughs> that monk, he's no good. He's a, he's a shoulder-carrying monk. So, you know, be careful about um, judging other people and criticizing other people. Uh, be careful about getting caught up in your own little mechanisms. We're all in avicca. We're all in ignorance. We're all trying to work this stuff out. And it's not fair. We, we, we don't know how things work. We don't know whether there's life after death. We don't know whether uh, a Tathagata, an enlightened being, is still existing somewhere in Nibbana or has he disappeared. And all these kind of deep, in-depth questions. We don't know the answers to it. It's not fair. We're trying to figure it out. And hopefully one day we'll get enlightened and figure it out. But in the meantime, we need to be careful about... Uh, you know, judging others and criticizing others and getting caught up in these little, um, you know, kind of rules and regulations or ideas of what you think is right or what they think is right. Um, I'll tell you one story that uh, in Bangkok there's uh, this question. We have a um, computer mall, right? And the monks really love the computer mall. And lay people don't like to see monks. There's always criticisms about it. And every so often there's a campaign that monks are not allowed in the computer mall and we just like take a picture of ourselves next to the sign and walk in. Because uh, we love our, we like our computers. But I've noticed that people want to email me, as, you know, they're happy sending me an email, but like where do I get my computer from? And so uh, one of them, one of these malls, MBK, in Bangkok, and I'd never actually been there before. And a friend of mine calls me up and he says, um, my iPhone doesn't work. I need to take my iPhone to be fixed. Uh, I offered my advice, which is the best way to fix an iPhone is to buy an Android, but he wasn't up for that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> 
And this friend of mine, since we're talking about computers, you would describe him as user-friendly. That is, whenever he wants something, he uses his friends. And <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't speak Thai, so he called me up, and he wants me to go to the computer center with him to get his iPhone fixed. And uh, I tried to wiggle out of it, but uh, he and I are good friends. And, you know, if you know him, you know what he's like. He's going to use you. So in the end, I agreed. And I'd been in a particular place in the morning, and one of the people in that place had given me some food. I just remember I didn't want it, whatever it was. And she'd given me this food in a pink bag. And so then my friend calls me up, so I have to go with him to this computer mall to get his iPhone fixed. And guess what? The guy in the shop spoke perfect English. And we just said, can you fix my iPhone? He said, leave it with me. That was it. That was my translation. I was like, do you want me to translate for that for you? <laughs> so <laughs> and then, so we have a couple of hours to walk around the mall, you see. Now, my friend says to me, I, can I carry your yam, your monk's bag? So I gave him my monk's bag, and he was carrying that around. And I was carrying the pink bag around. <laughs> and I thought, I'd rather you carry the pink bag and I'll carry my bag, but anyway. Um, so we're walking around this shopping mall with this pink bag. It's got some writing on it. I, c I didn't know what the writing was. So I'm walking around with this pink bag on my arm in the middle of the busiest shopping mall in Bangkok, uh, quite happy because I'm looking at all this tech stuff that I never usually get to see. And I've been walking around for a couple of hours, and I've got this pink bag. Now, I'm not ashamed of carrying a pink bag, I feel secure in my manhood. I think I'm you know, secure in my masculinity that I'm not going to be ashamed of walking around with a pink bag. Anyway, I get back to the, uh, the place where we're having the meditation in the evening, and as I walk through the doors, one of the ladies there, and she saw me walk through with the pink bag, and she went, ah, you can't carry that. I said, why? Because it's pink. She said, no because it says Victoria's Secret on it. <laughs> How am I supposed to know what that means? I <laughs> so what do you think? The people in Bangkok, do they, do they think, is this a good monk or a bad monk walking around? So the lesson to learn is not to, not to judge too much. You know, sometimes you don't know what's going on. You don't know what people are doing. And, you know, we're all in avicca. We're all in ignorance. You know, we don't understand enlightenment, life and death. We don't understand logos of shops. Um, you know, we, we're all confused. So I think the thing to do is to try to have much more patience with other people. Uh, rather than to to try and fix things or try to get involved in these little in d these little minute details and you know this guy's good because he does this and this guy's no good because he does that and then there's this person um, and you know not to get too you know, they're just bringing the ego into dharma and really I think the source of it all should be that we love dharma and we love to encourage dharma we love to encourage and facilitate other people to to love dharma. Uh, I can give you an example. Right now in Thailand, we have a... Uh, Thailand is one of the world's three military dictatorships. We have a new military dictator. And there's still some question of whether he's good or not good. Um, I have my own views on that. Again, we're on camera, so I'm going to be a bit careful. But what he's doing is he's sweeping into every department and say, right, now I have absolute dictatorship at the point of a gun. I can do anything I want. And so he's marching into every office and saying, right, I'm going to solve every problem. Have you ever known anybody who could do that? Yeah. I'm thinking of people like Napoleon. I mean, he was brilliant. He, was, he could solve problems. But, you know, when you have that kind of power, then you think your solutions are right. And then the things, you start doing things wrong, but you don't see yourself. Unless you have other people around you to tell you what you're doing wrong, you start to lose sight of the fact that you might be making mistakes. So, um, 
the general walks in and he's he's reforming Buddhism now as well. He said, you know, Buddhism needs reformed as well. These monks are no good. So he's decided he's going to make the monks good. Right? A military general, right? And he knows which is a good monk and which isn't a good monk and how to change it. And do you know how he's changing it? He set up a phone hotline to report bad monks. <laughs> Is that going to work? Is that really going to make all these monks say, oh, well, I'm going to be really good from now on, you know, just in case someone reports me to the general? Of course not. You can't legislate these kind of things. You, this is using the ego to go in and to try to change everything. And, you know, in a well-functioning uh, society, you can't really do that. This isn't working from the love of what's true and right. This is trying to criticize or trying to change everything that's wrong. If you use this approach in your meditation, you're not going to have a happy time. And very often people ask, the questions that people ask are things like, you know, oh, I have lights come up in my meditation, what do I do about that? Or how can I make myself sit longer? Or you know, I get an aching back, is there a special way that I can sit and not have an aching back? Or, you know, wanting to, you know, you're viewing the mind, you're viewing the content of the mind and wanting to correct it, change it. Again, this is all ego coming into it. You know, wanting to legislate in your mind exactly what you think your mind should have and what it shouldn't have. And to be a good meditator, really, you have to give up that kind of controlling, give up that kind of kind of egotistical, um, you know, trying to control every feature of your mind. Just imagine if, you, if your mind could be exactly the way you want it. With, pretty quickly, you'd find that you didn't have a very good idea of what your mind should be like, right? If you were an absolute dictator and you could change everything in the country, do you think really think the country would be perfectly well uh, acting? So another example, I don't know if you saw a couple of days ago in India, there was uh, somebody who legislated that when you send an SMS, his idea was, wouldn't it be nice if everybody in India sends an SMS in the Hindi language instead of English? That was his idea. So now he's put legislation out to ban SMSs in English language. Is that really going to make India a better country? And what about smiley faces? Are they English? Are they like... <laughs> Maybe you have like an Indian kind of special Hindi face. I don't know. Uh, this kind of legislating is not a very good approach when you, you're coming to meditation because you're still getting caught in the content of the mind. And you get caught in the content of the mind, you want to fix things. You know, you feel too sleepy, I want to fix that. You feel too, too much thinking, I want to fix that. Then you have thoughts come up of lust or desire or hatred or jealousy, then you want to fix that. And this um, approach of doing things with a critical mind, that you want to change things, make things just the way you want them, Think about your children. If you could make your children exactly the way you wanted them, do you think they would really be what you wanted? Right? You have to let them to grow and blossom into their own character, right? You can't change, you can't legislate, you can't change everything that they do. So the actual meditation is not complicated. You, the meditation is to... Um, when this thoughts come up in the mind, you don't get caught up in the signs and the features of that thought. You return your attention. Sati Sampajanya. <clears throat> there are discussions on the translations of this, but my translation is Sati is recollection. To recollect, so you have Marana Sati, to recollect death. You have different kinds of Sati. You can recollect <coughs> the quality of your own death, your own mortality. You can recollect loving kindness. You can recollect patience or generosity. The different kinds of sati. One kind of sati is sati sampajanya. Sampajanya they translate as awareness. Or you might say the feeling of your own consciousness. So you put sati and sampajanya together, you get this recollection of your own consciousness. That's independent of the content. Yeah? Consciousness is jitta. A ramana is the content of your mind. So... If you can see something, hear something, smell something, that's the content, that's the aramana. But the hearing, the seeing, the smelling, that's the jitta. If you return your attention to that, you start to lose the attachment to all the things of the world. 
the mind and the body start to become very bright, becomes very still. When the mind becomes bright and still, then you don't need a meditation object anymore. You can just sit with being. The actual word is eka bhava. Eka bhava means to become one. Eka is one and bhava is to become. So literally it's just to become one. Meditation is getting more and more simple. Okay? You've moved a long way from whether you had milk in your coffee this morning or not, you know. And now you're just you're sitting there with that recollection, with that knowing yourself, with that simply being with yourself. Uh, and that's what we're aiming at. It's not actually that complicated. And it's free of the content, free of the judging and the criticizing and the you know, the wanting to change things and the wanting to control everything in the mind. Because you're home, you're back at the home point. So when the Buddha says that, you know, desire is a cause of suffering and if you consider your life, can you possibly give up desire? It's not possible. I tried once. Didn't work very well. We had an all-night sitting, one of these all-night sittings in England. And I made the determination that from 7 p.m. till 4 in the morning, the rule was you don't let your shoulders touch the ground. So you, you can sit, you can stand, you can walk around, but you can't go to sleep lying down. We practice the art of sleeping sitting up, believe me. <laughs> so I made the determination I'm going to sit on this mat for the entire period. I don't have to meditate. Uh, I know I'm having no expectations of myself, but I'm not getting off this seat. And I thought, right, now all I have to do is be complete without desire. And I'm going to stay on this seat. I'm like, is staying on the seat, is that a desire? Do I have to get off the seat to prove that I don't have a desire to sit on the seat? <laughs> and then after, after an hour I thought, I really want the bathroom. Is that a desire? Do I have to give that desire up as well? Um, so it gets more and more complicated. You can't do it. It's just ridiculous to try. But if you hold the idea of desirelessness as a meditation object, and you withdraw the mind from getting engaged in the senses, then suddenly you find yourself in a spot without desire. You're like, I don't, there's nothing else I need to add to be happy because it's all right here, right in this spot. And when you see that, you see Dharma. When you see Dharma, then your motivation for doing things becomes a love of Dharma. So I want to finish off with a... Um, Mentioning my abbot, he's the acting Sangharaja, Supreme Patriarch of Thailand, and I really like his style myself. I have little to do with my temple, but I really admire him and his style. And a few years ago, his style is he will encourage things that he thinks are good, but he will never criticize things that he doesn't think are good. Right? He doesn't get involved in any kind of fighting, legislating, changing, reforming. Now, maybe he should. Maybe there are reforms that need to be done to Thai Buddhism. In fact, there are. Uh, we know that. We all know that. Um, but that's not his style. He's, he encourages things that he thinks are good. So a few years ago when there was this bhikkhuni um, ordinations in Australia and uh, some monks came to see him to clarify their position on this. And I said to them, did you bring any photos of your temple? Right. And they're like, we've come to discuss this issue. Now, you know, Wat Papong is doing this and this group is thinking that and the Somdet of what, of Somdet Puttajan is thinking this and blah, blah, blah. I'm like, okay, okay. It's not my job. I'm not the Sangharaja yet. Yeah, a few years. <laughs> and so they went and they saw him and they said, right, okay, here's our position and this is what we've taken and, and this is how we're considering that and that's what they have been doing and we think that this and and then the, the Sambhat is like, hmm, he says, he goes, did you bring any photos? <laughs> and that's what he'd be interested in. He's not going to get involved in any of these kind of fighting and the squabbling. But he will encourage things that he thinks are good. So he wants to see that you've built a temple and that you've got people coming in and that you've got a Dharma program. That's what he wants to see. So I personally, I find that a very good inspiration. I like that style. I like that idea. And this is why I've been saying today that, you know, meditate because you want to. Do Dharma because you love Dharma. 
then you have a gift to give to other people. You, you're helping to facilitate other people with Dharma without getting involved in their particular characters and, um, yeah, and characteristics and thoughts and views and opinions and all the rest of it. What you're doing is coming from a true love of Dharma. It's the same with your children. If you're going to raise children and you want to control everything that they do, what kind of children are you going to have? You know, a, kind of, a child that does everything that their parents tells them, you know, would be horrible. <laughs> you know, you wouldn't want that. You want to, when you're raising children, not that I have experience, but when you're raising children, what you want to do is just shine that love, right? You want to give them love, you want to give them support, and you want them to develop their own character. And they're going to go off track in certain times. They're going to do things wrong. They're going to make mistakes. But your job as a parent is there to to shine the love, give the love, to give the support, and make sure they're fed and go to school. You know, that's your job as a parent. So I think this is the same for us in our Dhamma groups, that we want to be careful about not getting involved in trying to control things. And to remember that our job is to 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 love Dharma, and that's all you really need to do. And then you're supporting other people, and then you're taking other people towards Dharma. Uh, this you may notice, uh, you know, just to finish off, I didn't intend to, but to finish off with a Bible quote. Um, remember that phrase in Matthew, I think it is, that God's, he's talking about God's love, and um, he says, uh, the sun it shines on the good and the evil, the rain it falls on the just and the unjust alike. So this is what we're trying to do with the Dharma. So the Dharma should be there for all people and not to be criticizing or breaking up into groups or separating or thinking that you know what would be good for everybody else. And shine like, like the sunlight will shine on all things alike, like the rain falls on all things alike. Uh, finish with a little poem since we're on the topic. Just A just person is a righteous person. I, I, some people might not be native English speakers. Uh, the rain it falleth on the just and the unjust feller, but more it falleth on the just, for the unjust stole the just's umbrella. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to leave it there. Um, so... Thank you for your attention. If you've got a particular question about what I've been talking about or anything else, then we've got a few minutes. Two questions, actually. Uh, let me see which one I want to ask first. Uh, the, yeah, I want to ask about love of meditation. and uh, we, we do meditation because we have a love of meditation. But in the course of doing meditation, we have also other side uh, benefits like what you have said uh, therapeutic uh, aspect like uh, lower cholesterol and uh, lower your blood pressure and other uh, benefits I, I, my view is that, that this should also be cherished because love, like if you have a love for your wife, the love can wane see, but then the side benefits are there to keep it going see. So, so in that aspect I think they go together and need not be just love of meditation that we do, but, but complement each other. You know. So, as I said, the, your love for your wife was very strong in the beginning, but can win, 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 and then, but, but she still cooks for you, she does still do your thing for you, because you cherish her. You see. So, so that's, the, that's the point I want to make. Okay. The, the second point. Uh, well, while we're <laughs> comparing with marriage, I should say meditation is like marriage, is you've got to find ways to keep it interesting. Uh, my second point is that uh, just now you talk about uh, we, we like something and we do it and then after that look for the reasons uh, why we are doing that uh, it's very interesting because in ev evolutionary psychology there is an inbuilt PR person in us, you know, the spin doctor if you like to, to make us look good So because if you like something and don't have a reason then when people ask you why are you doing it and you say I don't know then, then people will not respect you it's not a logical person. So you know, the spin doctor spins the reason after you've done it to say that this is the reason. So would you like to comment on that, that aspect of it? 
Yeah, I, that's, to me, is a very, very interesting topic. Um, and it's quite well researched in psychology that in, in many different ways. The, one of the ways that springs to my mind is a phenomenon called blind sight. And blind sight is with people who have eyes and optic nerves and the ocular area of the brain at the back can see images. But the images are not able to go into the conscious mind. So right now you're hearing the air conditioner, but you weren't aware of it, right? But when I mentioned it, you've brought it into the conscious mind, right? Because you can hear it now, right? So that's bringing something in. They actually call global workspace theory as a new theory. Um, it means that there's a like a CEO of the brain, and that's the con that's the consciousness that you're aware of. And only when something goes really wrong does the report go up to the CEO. You know, so you can walk down the road and you're not conscious of your feet moving unless you're a good meditator. Is that for me? Um, <laughs> but then if you stub your toe, you see your toe will send a message up to the consciousness. You need to pay conscious attention to the toe. So with blind sight people, they're unable to get visual images into the conscious area of the brain. And yet they're still able to see, but they will swear that they can't see. Right? So some of the tests that are done on these people are things like, you'll ask them, what color shirt am I wearing? And they'll say, I can't tell you what color shirt you're wearing because I can't see, I'm blind. And you say, well, guess. And they'll say, blue. And they'll be right. So they can actually see but they just don't believe they can see. But the curious thing is, on this topic, is if you ask them, why did you say blue, they will think up a reason. They'll say, well, you know, the sky is blue, or I remember my mother wearing blue, or something. And in actual fact, they can see it. They just will think up a different reason for to explain what has happened. It's a great topic, actually, but uh, it's nearly lunchtime, so... <laughs> For meditation, um, it's something that I want to do. However, um, it's somehow I find it difficult to do it every day. Uh, when I do do it, I do get into it, and I want to do it for longer, but I still find it difficult to do it every day. How do I strike the right balance between, I don't know, right effort and not yet not forcing. Uh, I guess this can be applied to um, other aspects of life where we want to develop better habits for ourselves. For example, sleeping early and waking early. I want to do that, but at the same time, there's another part of me that resists that, and I'm seesawing between the two. Thank you. Yeah, it's the old uh, evening self and morning self, that your evening self sets the alarm for 6 a.m., and your morning self laughs at it. You know, as soon as that alarm goes off, you're like, you're a different self in the morning. Uh, so there's really two questions about the meditation. Um, one thing, maybe you're just not suited to do it every day. Maybe, you know, that's a nice aspiration, but, you know, maybe some people, I'm one myself, I go in swings and roundabouts. So, um, Maybe don't set yourself too hard a target of like, I want to be a meditator who does it every day. Maybe do it because you love to do it. And some days you do more and some days you do less. Uh, so, you know, try not to set yourself standards and then blame yourself for not living up to them. Um, you need to do something every day. So I would recommend, rather than meditation every day, I would recommend a puja every day. Go and light some candles or incense or something or do a few bows in front of a tree or a statue or something, just so that every day you've reminded yourself that this spiritual goal is something that's important and something that you love, and not something that's work. You, the way you've been describing meditation makes it sound like you're thinking of it as work. Uh, so you've got to find a way to tell yourself that that isn't work. And so the main way that you can do that is not to judge the state of mind. So I can sit now and be just complete mayhem. And I can sit for an hour 
And, you know, some years ago, I used to slap myself really hard in the face because I used to say, 15 years as a monk and this is the result. And And maybe I needed to do that. That was a way to stir up some energy. But um, eventually I got used to like, well, sometimes the mind is not going to cooperate, but I'm going to continue with this the sun that shines on the good and the evil. This is the Dharma practice that I love, irrespective of my state of mind. And once I've done that, then now I meditate because I love to meditate, not because the meditation went well or it didn't go well. And so this is a trick that, you know, people get very caught up in the content of the mind and miss this light that you're shining, this light of awareness that is there. And it's a beautiful thing just to sit and have the intention to meditate is a beautiful thing already. Yeah. Uh, as for habits, there is a very good book called The Power of Habit. Have you read that? I can't remember. The, his name is Schwarzschlingelschum something. It's called The Power of Habit, and it talks about um, a habit, you know, have, have been analyzed. Habits have been analyzed, and uh, you need a trigger, you need an automated action, and you need a payoff. This research was picked up by a chap called Claude Hopkins, who was the world's first truly great advertising executive. And he was the one that he took this principle and he used it to sell toothpaste. And at that time in America, nobody used toothpaste and very few people brushed their teeth. And he needed to find a way to get people to brush their teeth. And by the way, toothpaste has absolutely zero cleaning effect on your teeth. I don't know if you know that. You can clean with water and it's exactly the same effect. The only thing toothpaste does is add fluoride. But his genius was he knew that you had to make a habit. So he made a very good advertising campaign of um, movie stars with these big, bright, smiling faces. Now everybody wants to be like a movie star. So you've got a trigger. You've got a reason to start brushing your teeth. The automated habit is the brushing. And the payoff, turns out he did a lot of research in how to give people a sensory payoff. And it turns out that two things give you a payoff for brushing your teeth, foam and mint. So if it's foamy and minty and it makes your mouth tingle, that gives you the payoff. And so he transformed the world. He, this was Pepsodent, and now everybody uses, um, you know, toothpaste, right? Without even knowing that it's it was thought of by this one guy who was selling one particular brand of toothpaste. Yeah. It's a lot of things like that, like bacon and eggs for the breakfast. You probably didn't know this was thought up by Edward Bernays. He decided that you should eat bacon and eggs for breakfast. So he, he used this same kind of routine. Uh, I could talk a lot. I like these things. Um, the, the power of habits. That will really give you a lot of insights into your bad habits and how to change habits. Excellent book. Sorry, you had the um, last hey, question. Um, yeah, thanks, uh, Venerable. Yeah, I would like to ask, um, Yeah, you were saying that the motivation for meditation should just be for the love of Dharma, but I thought that we all do Dharma in order to help ourselves suffer less. And I personally, I don't really like meditation because, uh, yeah, because a lot of times the mind is quite, uh, quite a lot of mayhem. Yeah, but uh, I do my motivation for it is that uh, I should just press on because it will bring uh, that eventually I'll get better and suffer okay. less. Yeah. So you need to find a way to make it fun. As I said at the beginning with this test, that the people who walked, if they were told it was for enjoyment, they ate less because they felt they'd already been rewarded. The people that were told that it's part of the exercise, they ate more because they felt they'd worked harder. So you need to find a way to make it fun, make it nice. Mm -hmm. Uh, The... My, when I was talking about making this as a motivation for meditation, I really mean all of the Dharma practice, motivation for all Dharma practice. And as the gentleman here said, it's not the only motivation. Uh, you know, motivations will change through the course. I'm just suggesting that this uh, focusing on the love of Dharma is something that makes it a happier process. 
uh, the mayhem in the mind, maybe you just need to make friends with the mayhem. Yes. Yeah, it's that make uh, making it fun and enjoyable. Uh, actually, sensual pleasures are a lot more enjoyable to me at this stage. <laughs> sure, but there's a difference in enjoyment of um, Game of Thrones and an hour of meditation. So one is a is a like an upright kind of um, happiness that comes independent of what's happening around you. Whereas sensory pleasure is utterly dependent on the thing that's happening around you. So then you never have that maturity, that solidity and that uprightness because your happiness depends on the things around you. I think we're just about done. So. Thank you, Rabanti, for all the wisdom you're sharing. Um, we have to stop here because Rabanti has to eat. Um, we shall now do the. Uh, can we do two, um, uh, three prostrations? Let's do three, three sadhus and let him take his lunch, and yes. then we can continue with. Uh,